crowd here. So anyway, let's get into some basic usage scenarios, but just a forward, just before we get into that, if you don't know what a logic analyzer is, or you want to have a general overview of the logic analyzer I'm using, then um, I've already posted some videos related to it, so I just need to go back in the history of it. And um, <coughs> just some key figures for those that haven't been on board. This is a logic analyzer from 1987, so it's considered retro equipment. But it does have 80 channels, um, it has 5 pods uh, with signal and uh, clock inputs and grounding. And um, it has 100 megahertz timing capability and 25 megahertz for state sampling. And then it has also like, uh, yeah, sort of retro st style, so it has a distinct state and um, timing analysis capability, so they're separated. But anyway, let's have a look at the experimental setup first. So anyways, the first sort of setup, I just put an Arduino Mega, it's running a very simple cyclic um, signaling program, so. And then we have the um, probe pod. Uh, one of them set up to read the signals. Use that as a basis for looking at the basic function. Yeah, and since this is a retro um, digital analyzer, the, ah, it, it can handle other logic levels, but um, the good thing about the Mega is that it um, uses 5 volts um, TTL signaling, so um, it's very much compatible with the um, retro logic analyzer. So, anyway, I use the actual device and um it's flickering, it's a, it's a CRT display, so it's not that common nowadays. It has a refresh frequency that I've tried to do recording with 24 frames, 30 frames, 60 frames, um, uh, HD, 4K, and, and I still can't, I think this is the nearest I can get to, to um, getting the flickering as low as possible. But anyway, I thought it was also just to be able to show the um, keyboard usage plus the, the actual display. So, um, so let's get started. So we, um, we call this the format. So then you see that you have all the pods that you can use. And you see that the, I have the pod 1 and it's actually saying, it gives like a bit of a preview of it. There's actually some kind of a signal um, going on on that, um, that pod. And here we see that it's got um, dual analyzers. Uh, uh, this you don't see in, in modern uh, um, uh, logic analyzers, really. I mean, uh, this is all integrated, uh, and so you don't see. Um, probably because of the um, processing capacity they have to actually implement two computers and so on. But anyway, we um, we say that we want to have a look at timing on that analyzer. So you can have a name for it, you know. and then we can actually we can scroll over and we can say, okay, what do we want to do with that? So we want to assign it to analyzer one, and um, now we're going to try an interesting feature. So, so let's go and try the outer scan. And here we see it disastrously fail. The, uh, the outer scaling in this is, um, I, I, I mean, it's it's either it doesn't work with the, uh, which I arguably speaking, my signal speed is not that high, so maybe that's what's going on. But as you see, that um, there's basically no, it hasn't. What the outer scale should do is that it should um, analyze what is the time per division to use and um, the, the most optimal for the display and then it should actually put all the um, signals here but that uh, it recognize that are actually have signals running but as you see it's kind of miserably failing. So anyway so what we need to do is we need to set this up manually. So I'm gonna guess it's 200 milliseconds we can start with and then you can actually go in here 
Waveforms insert waveform. What? And then that's pod one. And um, symbol number one. And then we can actually get rid of that because I actually added it. And then we can take run. So now we see that it's picking up the signal for the first one. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, insert pod one. So I'm going to now insert 16 of these. So we get them all. But that's the way you do it. You you click on there, and then you say insert, and then it will suggest pod one, and then it will automatically index to the next one that has to be inside. Okay, yeah, that's a little bit fascinating. So I can add seven signals, and uh, the last one I just said all because it, 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 will, it will not allow me to select signal eight. So I have 16 signals running, and I increased the time per division to 500 milliseconds. So you can actually see the, um, the pattern that I'm pushing out with a bit of a delay in between. I've got to find out what is the magic behind not being able to add all 16 signals to the timing display. Or is it limited to cell per pod or per machine? Okay, so I had to go back to format. I forgot that the outer scale was screwing with this also that it um, actually was only enabling them. So let's see, because it's got a bit mask here. So one can actually set what signals are act. <laughs> the outer scale <laughs> screwed it up. So, well, let's get the mess out. Oh, anyway, so now we got all the signals. And there's a bug. What is that? Repeat it. So I'm actually look at my program. Is that the glitch in the program or why is it picking up those? Because basically, I have a program to just do this. Let's try and run it again and see if it comes back. And it's 500 milliseconds. No, oh, but it seems to be wanting to display it. So I actually have to look in the program and see what that is. But anyway, this is the basic timing display, so nothing magical. So you put the time per division on. Yeah, the auto scaling there seems to be a little bit of a problem. You can also set up to display all the all the um, pod signals in one go, so it can helps you adjust the um, scaling, so you know that you've got all the signals in the display. Now, let's take the uh, simplest operation. In, in the timing displays, you usually want to measure things. So, um, let's uh, put on the timing markers. Let's move some cursors around. So here you see the so-called X cursor. So let's put it on the beginning of that one, just for the fun of it. And then we take the next one, which is the zero. And then we put it like there. And then you can actually go over here, time X to zero. And here you get the um, different times. And the time between X and zero is nine milliseconds. So. But anyway, I can do any kind of these common, and then there's uh, options for pattern-based measurements and things. And then the other trick is that if I wants to zero that, then go into the field, click on the button. Oh wait, uh, yeah, no, I was going to set it to zero, so we just just press the button, and then you get into here, and then you can set that basically zero it out. Same with that one. So we just take that one, zero it up. So it's actually quite easy to to move around and adjust, and then um, I can also go into here and um, expand it out to make it easier to actually measure things. 
okay, this was a bit spooky. Yeah. Thought that it can't possibly be the program because I've used this program before many times. And um, I just um, forced the Arduino EDA to upload the program again into the Arduino Mega and then get this. So I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea where the extra pulse came from. <coughs> anyway, spooky things happen, but um, re upload of the application to the Mega that worked. So fixed it. So, what I'm going to do now, since this is the first time I'm actually using this um, more seriously, I'm going to actually do the same pattern test with all the um, different pods. Right. I thought this might not be that useful, but it's actually there's certain things one has to do, so I wanted to add actually all the pods on um, for time. And, um, then you need to come in here like we did for the first pod, but then um, for each label one defines you can be a maximum of 32 by bits, so that means that um, since I have five pods, then um, basically I can't have them all in one in in one label. Don't exactly know why, but um, uh, initially when this is displayed, to be able to move between the different pods, as you see, there's only three of them here, so you have to press this button, and then you can. Um, go through all the pods that you have here so it changes. And what, what you need to do is you need to, um, or what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, yeah, well you can actually do it. So I'll go here, and I'll say, modify label, Pod three, so I'll bit mask it. Data in there, and then I will just continue with the other two. Oh, that's all them defined, and bit masks and all of this. So let me just this the, now shows the overall labeling and the next data and then just the display. And then here you see that it puts the first bit of each. No, no, it's showing all, so that's good. So now, if I take run, then it should basically be taking all the pods there. But of course, there's not. I haven't got any active signal on any of the other ones. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to the back of the device and I'm going to move this same setup that's now on um, pod one. I'm going to move it to pod two, pod three, pod. I'm just going to check each each um, input um, pod <coughs> that, that actually comes into the device in the correct way. Anyway, now it's uh, pod 1 and I'll move to the pod 2. Let's see what happens when we press run now. So that's pod 2, and basically I don't need to configure all the, <coughs> all the signals because I can actually just count how many there are here. So, yep, 16 signals, so that's pod 2 inputs are operational, so I'll just go through the rest. Let's do um, a change here. So I took the went in system configuration, took all the extra pods away. Everything worked fine. So my unit seems to be technically okay. But now we're going to switch to state with one pod up here. And um, 
<clears throat> to be able to analyze state, then you need to have um, a um, clock signal to run it. So um, let's get that set up. Everybody now I set up a clock lead, and it's the one that comes out of the end there. And it ends up going into the Arduino Mega. We see uh, J1 or uh, J and the rising edge of that clock will designate when it should capture the, the state. And then it's pod 1 and all signals are active. So, see what happens when this runs. So now it's acquiring. That's very hard to see, but it's actually counting up gathering data. And now, since we haven't got a stop criteria, so we have to stop it now. So, oh, look. and then we get in hexadecimal, and now we've uh, chosen to um, use base hex. So now we get for each raising where the clock has goes up, then it captures the state on the um, 16 signals, and that creates the equivalent. And as you see, it's counting up one, two, four, eight. You know, and then it starts from zero again. And to be able to scroll through this list, then you use that one, and then you can just go through the advancing history. And then if you wanted to trigger on something specific, then you can actually set up sequence levels. So this, I think this could be up to eight levels of different rules that you can set up. Um, and of course, I don't have really any any sequence set up for this one, but it's actually quite easy to, to set up, so you can actually go in here, and then you can so you can um, set up what value, ah, lots of different things, so, so if you don't know exactly what what sequence you have, then it's actually not much point in, in setting it up, so I just leave it empty, so then it triggers on it, so basically when you hit run, then it starts recording and then um, when you press stop then you can actually see the result. Of course if you're doing real analysis work then you probably know uh, you want to trigger on a specific action like uh, access to a specific memory location or it's picking up a certain instruction or yeah, whatever is equivalent to system needs. But this is how um, state works in this one. So state, state is the most important thing to remember is in this context state needs uh, a clock and the clock is on the pod. Uh, so you can actually, actually select here you can say okay so we have for the pod J, J, the J clock single on pod 1 and then you can define on what criteria is it the raising edge or you know, falling edge or you know, other different criteria? Ah, let's go ahead and set up one. So, if we do a simple one, then we take level one and then we say we're going to um, store in all the levels, hope we'll get it to trigger on a. And A is referring down here, so actually the value is there. So now it says don't care, we'll go in there and we say 2000. And then we'll run it. And as you see it started at 2000, at the state x2000. So when it, uh, the first time it uh, encountered that um, value on the um, that signal by the 16-bit signal value, then it um, started gathering data. And then just wanted to show that it's like most logic analyzers, they also gather the historical data, so it's a, it won't just store it. It'll take a little bit of history, so you can actually go back. And the last thing to look at is timing and acquisition mode glitch. And that's defined um, 
unexpected happenings. So I put in here that on pod one, when we get pattern one, it should be present for more than five milliseconds. And then in that time context, I'm looking for a glitch. So an instability in the signal. So hopefully then So oh, now it triggered, and um, I actually had a mistake that for the pod one I forgot to put in the, it starts from zero, and then ends at um, 15 to get the full 16 bits, so I actually forgot the, <laughs> the first one, but um, if we zoom in a bit, See that I've introduced a little glitch just there. So that's like two milliseconds. So the idea being that this, when you're looking for glitches, is that this signal here, the state should be stable. So you're coming along here and then it goes to one and it should stay stable. And what you're telling this device to is to look for that kind of stuff where the state actually it changes state and basically in a, in a way that it shouldn't and, um, and of course it's a little most of the time when you're doing this kind of engineering you <laughs> it's to actually find the trigger definitions that are are to be used to be able to identify what that signal is is tripping in the, in the wrong way and and usually you don't, you uh, you combine the use of a logic analyzer with a digital scope and even, yeah, all uh, higher end logic analyzers they actually have built in oscilloscopes so that when you do a glitch trigger then it automatically switches to oscilloscope and triggers there also so you actually get a direct picture of what's happening, even if it's intermittent. I think I just thought I'd show that as a last trick for this session. So anyway, that was the basics of using the device. So that's um, yeah, pod setup. Um, if you're going to do state or timing analysis and how to select the bits you're going to analyze, and then a little bit about the triggering mechanism and um, for for um, timing and state and um, yeah overview of glitch handling so, uh, so now with these these basics you should be able to actually if you ever get your hands on one of these then you should be able to like basic test it and um, also have our top level understanding of the main functionality and the rest of course is available in the manual so if, if you ever need to dig into it more deeply then the reference manuals will tell you how to do all the extra tricks that I haven't shown here Anyway, we might come back with um, using this device in combination with projects or, or just to highlight some specific area. We'll see. Anyway, see you in the next one.